Hello, everybody, church. I have just been looking at the numbers from last week, and I got to tell you, I am blown away at what you have done. You have shared the talk, you have connected, you have really taken this as an opportunity to get involved with a church, and that's a beautiful thing. In fact, we'll have good speakers every week, I promise you that. But can I tell you what the real secret is? This is about you. It's everybody church, and your connecting is so, so very important. Well, we're going to go to the auditorium because Stan has another conversation starter from the life of Jesus, and I bet it's going to be good. All right. Hey, everybody, church, uh, let's jump in. This is what we do, and it's what I love to do, and that's take a text um, or a concept. But for me, a lot of time, it's a text. I love Scripture. And I just want to walk through another text with you today that I think is so central. And maybe the first two of these sermons or lessons that we do are going to be kind of underscoring what we're really about here at Everybody Church. And I think one of the quintessential texts that really is a part of the fabric, kind of the underpinnings in my own mind and the minds of my partners, uh, Ray and Neil, here in Atlanta at the Village, um, is this text. This has got to be one of my top five texts in the Scripture, so uh, away from all of the caveats and disclaimers, let's just jump in. It's Luke 15, and for those of you that don't know what Luke 15 is, you will as soon as I describe it. Uh, Luke 15 is that incredible text where Jesus gives us a story of what we call the prodigal son, but He gives us more than just that, so I want to back up to the beginning of the chapter and kind of set the stage of where that, you know, that incredible story came from. Verse 1 of Luke 15, then all the tax collectors, okay, that's a caricatured, almost cliched now form of all of the bad people. These were the fellow uh, Jews who had sold out their brothers and sisters, their, their fellow Jews, to work for the Roman government and collect taxes, taxes which already were onerous and probably, you know, exalted of what they should have been. But many tax collectors, well, all of the tax collectors were given dispensation. They were given the right by the Roman authorities to even take a little more, and that would be their cut. So they had latitude to really gouge the people. So this was not a popular group of people. These were like, uh, these were the worst of the worst. So Jesus is really, I mean, the writer of Luke is really setting this up, that all of the tax collectors, the bad folk, and the sinners, if you're not clear, uh, then he makes, the, he, he makes the clarity for you, the theological statement that, that not only were they tax collectors, but they were sinners, that just the bad people in town drew near to him to hear him. We have forever pointed out that Jesus was the friend of sinners, which I thought forever, maybe you didn't, but I thought forever meant that Jesus was magnanimous, and the statement was really pointing out how magnanimous and gracious he was because Jesus would be a friend to sinners. Well, of course Jesus was a friend to sinners. As the emissary of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, who's representing God, Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Of course God is a friend to sinners. That's the whole point. God loves people no matter how broken they are. The text doesn't say Jesus was a friend to sinners. That's not, I mean, that's compelling in its own right. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, understate that or diminish that. But it says something more. Jesus wasn't a friend to sinners. The text says, it said he was the friend of sinners. Now, that prepositional difference is important. To be called the friend of sinners means that when the sinners and tax collectors were sitting around by themselves talking about their friends, Jesus was in the list. He was a friend of theirs. And I think that's even more compelling. That really tells us even more about who Jesus was. So when Jesus was going to these people, he wasn't the magnanimous, you know, the incredibly gracious and merciful one that the people just, you know, set at his feet and were in awe of how great he was. I mean, Jesus wasn't going to them saying, hey, I still love you. I mean, 
Have you ever been told by someone, I want you to know, I still love you. I still love you is one of the grossest things that anybody can ever say to me. Because what they're saying, there's so much uh, in that word still. To say, I love you, great. But to say, Stan Mitchell, I still love you is their way of saying, in spite of how bad you are, and in spite of how wrong you are, I am so great that I still have the capacity to love even you. When people do that to me, I'm like, hey, God bless you, I love you too, keep your still. Jesus didn't go to people like this and say, in spite of how awful you are, I love you. No, Jesus was a friend of sinners. He came to them, and they were comfortable with him. Gosh, that says so much more. Of course God was comfortable with them. But the fact that they were comfortable with him, wow. What does it mean? Well, the story goes on. Um, Jesus was sitting with them. And they were reclined at the table, and the Pharisees and scribes complained. Again, one of the reasons this is so, you know, at the heart of what we're doing here at Everybody Church. For those who have felt the pain of being excluded, for those who have felt, you know, the stinging, sore pain of being rejected, uh, uh, for sure, rejection is hard enough, but to be rejected wrongly on on ridiculous grounds. Uh, This is your story. The Pharisees came to Jesus, and again, much like the last lesson that I gave about the fellow who was born blind, and Jesus walked by and saw him, and the disciples said, who sinned, this guy? Jesus saw the man, they saw a theological issue. Same thing here. Jesus is sitting with this group of people, and the Pharisees look at him, and they say, you shouldn't be with them. So again, a group of people are being third-personed. A group of people are being diminished and dehumanized by a religious body of people. They look at Jesus as though the people aren't even sitting there, and they're like, hey, you, as a rabbi, a teacher, an emissary of God, you can't be with people like this. And again, that points to an even deeper worldview that these fellas had. And that worldview was, if you're going to represent God, then you need to act like God. And God separates from sinful people, which I think is an entirely wrong premise. And I think a religion built on the idea of inherent separation, this presumption that God's holiness is defined by God's incapacity to be with people when they're most broken or they're sinful. What an atrocious view of God. Not only did I not believe that's the definition of God's holiness, I think it's the exact opposite. I think the holiness of God is measured by God's absolute incapacity, unwillingness to ever be separate from us, no matter how broken we might be. And I think when Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, What he's saying is, you know, in the Trinity, there's not a good cop, bad cop. There's not a part that's so holy it can't be with us, but I come somehow clothed in the chain mail of human flesh, and I have the ability through the rubber gloves of the incarnation to touch you guys with a mask on. No. Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus' absolute unwillingness to yield to the religious idea of separating from certain people was Jesus' way of saying, this is who God is. Nobody's ever separated. You can't be separated from the love of God. But the Pharisees said, you're a representative of God. You've got to act like God, which Jesus could have said, that's exactly what I'm doing. But the Pharisees said, we know what God does. God separates from people like them. Jesus has compassion on the Pharisees. I mean, we've got to be really careful, you know, as human beings, as we grow spiritually, even religiously. We've got to be careful that we don't move from one form of fundamentalism to the next form of fundamentalism. We've got to be careful that we don't, you know, become those who now have moved beyond exclusion, but we exclude the excluders. 
You know, we've moved beyond judgment, but we now judge the judgers. I mean, there's, it's, a, it's a tricky line. We've got to be really careful with this. Jesus maintained compassion for the Pharisees, and I want to show you how. He looked at them, and he said, can I tell you a story? Instead of arguing the point theologically, instead of standing up and saying, you're wrong, and you know, voraciously or vociferously defending those he was sitting with, Jesus did what all of the great sages do, and this is tough. Jesus did what the Socrates and the Mandelas and the Kings and the Solzhenitsyns do. Jesus maintained not only a love and a sympathy for the marginalized and the victims of human ill will and bad religious systems, bad religious ideas. Jesus maintained not only a sympathy and a love for those and a protective sense for those, but he did what people like King and Mandela also have done and Gandhi. He maintained a love and a sympathy even for the perpetrator. This is the reason that he could look down from the cross and say, forgive them. And all of heaven and earth you know, has the right to say, forgive them, why? And Jesus thoughtfully says, because they don't know what they're doing. Wow, there's a lot in that. They don't know what they're doing. What do you mean they don't know what they're doing? Their eyes are wide open. They're murdering a human being unfairly. Jesus said, yes, and that's true. And there is, of course, agency and responsibility. But at a deeper level, Jesus, I think, believed what I deeply believe. And I believe it because I saw it first in Jesus that every human being at the core of their being is the imago Dei, the image of God, and no one is ever beyond the capacity for repair. And at deep subterranean levels, Jesus was able to say, even the perpetrator doesn't know fully what they're doing, and to some extent, they are the greater victim of their crime. And I just want to pause and say, if you can't see that, and if you can't say that, and that even chafes you, fine, just leave it set for a while, come back to it. It will come back to you. Uh, Jesus maintained a sympathy for the perpetrator, and it was compassion that caused him to look at them, and instead of arguing with them, rebuking them, and excluding them now, and saying, no, 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 this group of marginalized people you've excluded, we're going to start an exclusive club that leaves you out. Jesus said, can I tell you a story? And as a matter of fact, he says, I'd like to tell you three. They're kind of together. And he starts and he says, there was a a woman who had 10 coins. And these 10 coins were everything that she had in the world. I mean, it was her retirement, most likely. And so it's not like 10 pennies. These are 10 coins that maybe amount to a sum that was going to somehow see her through to the end of her life. I mean, it's everything. It's her retirement. And one day, she was checking on her coins, and she found out that one of them was missing. And she was distraught. Again, she's not missing a dime or a nickel. She's missing a tenth of her life. And she's so distraught that she turns the house upside down, Jesus said. And the long story made short is when she finally had turned the house upside down to the nth degree, somewhere in one of the crevices of the home, She found the coin. And she was so excited, Jesus said. Now remember, the marginalized tax collectors and sinners, the hated ones, are sitting there listening to this story, knowing that to some degree it's a defense of them. The Pharisees on the other side are standing there with their arms crossed listening to this story. And and both groups are trying to kind of, you know, extrapolate, look forward and say, okay, what's he saying here? So just remember that's the setting. They're, they're listening intently from two different perspectives. And Jesus is lovingly baiting them both. I mean, he's reeling slowly in the beginning, but reeling. And he said, when she found the coin, she called her friends and her family. And she said, you got to get over here and you got to throw a party with me. 
and celebrate this beautiful redemption. So the Pharisees have got to think, okay, these poor tax collectors and sinners, they're the lost coin. We're obviously the nine good ones that stay in place. We stay in the vault. We, we, we don't worry anybody. We do the right thing. We are the nine coins, and they are the rogue coin that gets lost. And he's kind of a do-gooder and pulls them in. And Okay, maybe we will give, if these guys will hear his good teaching and be converted and repent of their sins and become good people like us, okay, we get where you're going. And I don't doubt that the group he was defending kind of appropriated the story the same way. Jesus said, and there was a man, a shepherd, he had 90, or he had 100 sheep. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, the shepherd had a hundred sheep, and one day he was out tending them, and the night set, and it was cold, and the rain, and the sleep began to fall, and he was able to hustle all of his sheep back into the barn, get them in the sheepfold, and as he did what a good shepherd does, he counted. And as he counted, trying to come up with the number, the full number of 100, he kept coming up with 99. I'm sure, you know, forensically, he counted a couple of times, and 99 was all he could get. I love the fact that when we see Jesus, we see God. And this is telling me something about the mathematics of God's heart. And the mathematics of God's heart is... I will not be satisfied with 99% inclusion. I will not be satisfied with a 99% you know, call of the role. I mean, I grew up in a world, I grew up in a religious world where I thought the good news was a small fraction of people would live in an eternal blissful state while the majority of humans who ever lived, somehow that wide road meant that they were going to burn forever. This is an entirely different take on the heart of God. This says that not only is God not satisfied with 15% or 20% or 50%, God looks at 99% inclusion and says, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. And so that's the heart of everybodychurch.com. I mean, my partners in this, you know, Ray and Neil, Ray pastors a church here. I work here. I work at, in, at Nashville, at Grace Point. I'm working at East Lake out in Seattle. I, I do lots of work in lots of different churches. I travel all over the place. And yet, Everybody Church is our way of saying, you know, maybe in all the work that we do, we're covering a pretty good number, but it's not enough. It's not enough until some of you who live in small towns in Idaho that are 200 miles from an inclusive church and some of you that live in, you know, little rural places in Mississippi or Illinois and you're geographically disconnected from a church, maybe even some of you who live down the street from the village, but you're disconnected psychologically, emotionally because you've been so hurt that you're not ready to walk back into a church. Everybody church is our way of saying 99% is not enough. We want to get this to everybody. This community is global and universal, and we're not sleeping till 100% feel this kind of love. Shepherd goes out looking, finds the sheep, puts it on his shoulders. The agency of God, the agency of the loving one, brings the lost sheep home. Shepherd wakes everybody in the family up, all the friends up, wakes the neighbors up and says, you got to get over here and celebrate with me. Jesus then said what he had said before. He said, that's the way it is in heaven when one of these sinners repents and comes home. The Pharisees again, they get it. The lost sheep are these poor, pitiful tax collectors and sinners. We're the good, dutiful 99 sheep who are always on the front row. We're always in the synagogue, always in the church. We're not messing things up. Shepherd never has to stay up all night long for us. God doesn't have to put in overtime. If everybody lived like we live, God would get a good night's rest. But, okay. As long as you're willing to get the sheep back in, as long as these tax collectors and sinners will repent, quit living the life that they live, and come do dutiful things like the 99 rest of us, okay, maybe 
we'll compromise with you here and see where you're going. Jesus said one more story. 10 coins, 100 sheep. There was a man with two sons. I like the pedagogy here. I like the teaching style here. Jesus is like 10, 100, and instead of going to 1,000, Jesus said for my altar call here, let's bring this down to two so we can get really clear. Two sons, and one day the younger son came to him and said, I don't want to be here. I don't feel, I don't feel the connection. Um, I, I, I really don't, in that day, a lot of people say that this was the young man's, son, uh, young man's way of saying, I don't even want to be your son. I mean, you're not my dad. This was, this was not, you know, within our culture, this would be pretty reasonable, fairly reasonable, but in the culture in which this was written, this was an incredibly unreasonable, stark request. I, I don't want to be your son. I don't want you to be my dad. I want to leave this place, never look back, and forget I was ever here. This is an identity shift. The father gave the young man his inheritance. The kid goes off. We call him the prodigal. Prodigal means wasteful. And I'm not sure that's a good term because honestly, looking back reflectively, I don't think the kid wasted the inheritance because the journey that he took away from the father's house, away from the system, away from safety, was the journey that ultimately brought him to his senses and led him home. So that doesn't feel wasteful to me. And that's one of the reasons that I think everybody takes their journey, and I'm not really big. I don't think my role as a pastor, a minister, is to interrupt people's journey. I'm just, I, I come alongside people and hey, I, I may not be thrilled about where you are in your journey right now, but your journey is your journey. I mean, we've all taken a long journey, and no one could interrupt that. And everything, as Richard Rohr says, belongs. And all things, Paul said, work together for good. I mean, the father not only allowed the boy to take a, a, a journey, he financed the trip. That's how much he believed in this. Because the reality is there are some things that some of us I mean, self-included, there are some things that some of us only learned in the far country and the hog pen that we never learned at home. So everybody takes their journey. And prodigal, wasteful, I think is missing the point. Okay, home stretch. Jesus says the kid is knee-deep in a hog pen, he realizes that the guy he's working for won't even let him eat the food that he's feeding the hogs with. I mean, he's, he's, it's, this is what we call in the 12-step world rock bottom. And he has a salvific, a saving moment. The old King James described that salvation moment this way. It said, he came to himself. I like that. He didn't come to God you say, well, isn't that salvation? No. Um, salvation is not coming to God because God never left. Uh, apologies to Pascal. There is no God-shaped blank because God never left. God did not leave that blank. We may not recognize the presence of God, but it's always there. If I made my bed in hell, David said, I finally look back and realize you were there. He didn't come to God, and he didn't come to the Father. He came to himself. And he said, oh my God, I'm a son, and I have a home, and I'm going to go. Now, I'll come back to this story, and I'll tell this story probably a hundred times in everybodychurch.com. I'll, I'll, I'm going to be telling this story a lot. This is a big one, and there's a lot to get from it. But what I really wanted to point out today that I think so underscores the heart of everybody church is that Jesus said, and that kid came home and the father celebrated, threw a big party for him, because that's what you do when a lost coin is found, a lost sheep is found, a lost son is found. And so at this point, the Pharisees and the tax collectors and sinners, they get it. Jesus is really making his point now. He's driving it. And so they think the story is going to end. Lost coin, lost sheep, lost sign comes home. That's who these people are. Okay, 
maybe we'll back off. You guys straighten up. Come home, get found. Jesus then looks at the Pharisees, and this is the story. Jesus said, and at the party of the younger son, the father looks around and says, somebody, where's my boy? Not the young kid. Where's my oldest son? The one that I want here more than anybody celebrating the coming home of his brother. Jesus is like, surely he's here. Or the father says, surely he's here. And the father now in the story is doing something the father has not done before. He's looking for someone. He's looking for something. You know how you know which coin was lost? It's the one the woman, woman went looking for. You know how you know which sheep was lost? It's the one the shepherd went looking for. You know how you know which son was lost? It's the one the father went looking for. The father really didn't go looking for the youngest son. He went out to meet him, but he didn't go to the far country looking. He let the far country do what it does. Sometimes you don't interrupt people's process. But he is definitively looking for the elder son. He's looking for him because the elder son is lost. And the father finally, like the woman with the lost coin and the shepherd with the sheep, the father finally in loving agency goes and finds the elder brother and the elder brother is sitting up on a tree underneath a sycamore tree, leaning back against it and his jaw is clenched and his eyes are brimming with tears, and his brow is furrowed. And as the old man sits down beside him, the elder brother doesn't even break his gaze from the party going down below. And the father sits beside him and says, Where are you, boy? And the elder brother the elder brother, this is the great mercy and insight of Jesus. He not only understood why a person becomes a tax collector, he not only understood why a person becomes a sinner or a streetwalker or a prostitute or a liar or a murderer, he not only understood these people, but this day Jesus looked. I mean, if we're really going to be everybody church, then those of us that have been excluded cannot be the excluders or we miss the point. Jesus on that day in Luke 15 was not wrapping his arms around the tax collectors and sinners and saying, oh no, they can be a part. Jesus was wrapping his arms around the Pharisees saying, and so can you. Jesus looks at the Pharisees who he knew to be, he knew them to be the elder brother. And he said, I want to tell you why you're standing here today in this kind of condescending judgment. I want to tell you what are the underpinnings of your self-righteousness. I want to tell you where your hate and exclusionary practices are coming from. They come from your own heart. And he explained by putting these words in the mouth of the elder brother, the elder brother looked through those brimming, tear-filled eyes and through those gritted teeth said to the father, I have been here slaving my whole life for you. And then the tears spill over the bottom lid. And the kid looks at his dad and says, you've never so much as given me a goat to celebrate with my friends. And this kid, this Joseph with his coat of many colors who can't do any wrong, he goes off and wastes his life and you throw this big party for him. Why not me? Oh, at this point, surely something will begin to strike a chord for the self-righteous Pharisee. Jesus said, I know you, Pharisee. The reason you can't show up at the party of the sinner, the younger son, is because you've never felt the party for yourself. 
And Jesus says the father did not look at him and say, you're right, you've been a slave forever, I've mistreated you, and I've never done anything for you. The father looks at him and through tears says, slavery? This is what this has been for you? And the father then realizes that journeys, sometimes painful journeys, of coming home to an identity that has intrinsically always been yours, those journeys sometimes go the route of the far country and hog pens and debauchery, and sometimes those journeys take place with a person never escaping the front row of the church. You can be a slave in the far country, and you can be a slave in the synagogue. You can be a slave at the bar and the brothel, and you can be a slave, God, I've done it, in the pulpit. And Jesus says that the Father said to him, everything I've ever had is yours, and you have always been with me. The three stories and ultimately the story of the prodigal son are actually the story of the elder brother. Jesus was not defending the tax collectors and sinners that day against the sad religion of the Pharisee. That day he was reaching for the Pharisee to defend them against the damage they were doing to themselves. Jesus knew that Pharisees like me, elder brothers like me, and elder brothers like many of us, If we ever come to a place of understanding the party that's been thrown for us, we will have no problem showing up at the party that's thrown for everybody else. That's the heart of everybody church. We're not a bunch of victims here licking our wounds saying, oh, the church has been bad to us. Nope. As Henry Nouwen said, there is a part of me that is the father, there is a part of me that is the younger brother, and there is a part of me that is the elder brother. And I just want to say that all of those belong here. And this is my prayer that both Pharisee and tax collector may heal in the presence of a father that includes us all. Now for crying out loud, Let's enjoy one another's party because ultimately my party is your party and your party is my party. It's actually just one big party. That's Everybody Church. God bless you. Really, really glad to be with you guys today. We'll see you soon. Wow. Did you like that? That's what I call a conversation starter. And if it spoke to your heart, then why don't you right now just push share and let your friends hear it too. Many of them, I think, would appreciate you doing that. We wanna remind you, Everybody Church is not just about a teaching each week. Everybody Church is about you. And so if you wanna connect, this is where you go, facebook.com slash everybodychurch. And there are groups that you can participate in, and there's really a way to get connected, and that's what we want, because it's not about the speakers, although they're gonna be good, it's about you. The drunk so sing and the sober sing along. Who it's for the one in the ring to finally feel strong. I wanna hear what the angels played when they walked my daddy home. I wanna write a song the drunk so sing. glass and sing along mm-hmm. I want to learn what David played when he found himself alone let it ring let it ring on every street and stage to the lonely my way home I want to learn what 
David played Oh, and won't you sing along And oh, 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 oh. Raise your glass and sing along Raise your glass Everybody Church is a 501c3 nonprofit that uses the tools of social media and digital innovation to connect progressively minded people around the world to change our world. Regardless of differences, we envision a world marked by equality, sustainability, justice, and love. Our work is made possible by tithes and offerings and charitable giving from members of our community. Everybodychurch.com slash give.